Hi everyone, um, I'm now going to do a demonstration of how to estimate a vector autoregression model. Uh, I'm going to use a bivariate model where we are going to look at the Fisher hypothesis whereby we are going to um, estimate um, a relationship uh, between um, interest rate and inflation rate. Okay, so as you can see on the screen here, you have uh, a work file, eViews work file, which is open. So in this work file, um, of course, the variables that I'm going to concentrate on is CPI, which stands for inflation, and PR, which stands for the interest rate. Now, um, of course, whenever you are going to do the estimation of the um, VAR or the vector autoregression model, you have to make sure that the variables are integrated of the same order. So meaning if they integrated of order one so all of them should be integrated of order one if they're integrated of order two they should all be integrated of order two um, in other words you shouldn't have a combination of where some variables are integrated of order zero and some of order one you could do the estimation but the results will not be as good and as accurate as opposed to when the variables are integrated of order one or when they are integrated of order two all right so um, I have already checked these variables and indeed they are both integrated of order one. So therefore what I'll go and do is just to start with the whole process of now how to do the estimation. Of course, the first step for any time series analysis is doing uh, the unit root test. So I've done that. I'm not going to go through it here because we've also done it with a single equation approach. So but it is the very same approach. All right. So now that I know the variables are integrated of order one so now i can just go ahead and estimate now the var or rather follow the next um steps that i need to undertake in order for the var model to be estimated all right so what do i do so i highlight by variables starting with the um so-called dependent variable although we don't really have a dependent independent because all the variables enter the model as endogenous so i highlight the variables right click then open them as var now once i open them as a var you'll see a box here so first i have to estimate a standard var so once i estimate a standard var so i must just click on okay once i click on okay i get a box for the output now from this output it's where i have to do the, the following steps so remember that in the theoretical class when I was talking about um, the um, steps to follow. So if we have first to determine whether our VAR model is stable. So we can use the table or we can use the graph. I'll show you both. So I click on. Sorry, let me just repeat that. I go on view, click on lag structure and then look for AR table. So this is the table that I was referring to. And it basically shows you that um here our var model is stable in level so and hence it shows this um footnote that there's no root lies outside the unit circle and then i can also show you with the graph lag structure al ar graph and then here it is and you can see the dots are actually in the range of negative one and one so meaning they are within the unit circle and so therefore our air um, characteristic polynomial does fulfill the stability condition now the next step is to go and test for lag exclusion in other words you want to determine whether should we estimate the model with lags or should we estimate the model without lags so we Go on view lag structure and then we come on lag exclusion test we click on that and we get the table here and we can already and remember that we have to check at the p values for the joint and we can already see from lag one and from lag two our p value are less than the um, uh, level of significance which is five percent indicating that we have to reject the now hypothesis that um, the restrictive uh, or the restricted model, which is the model without lags, is viable. And so therefore, uh, again, we are good to go that um, we can actually go ahead and estimate a model with lags. And then the next step, again, is to go to view, click on lag structure, and then um, check for the lag length criteria. 
we click on lag length criteria because we want to know what is the optimal lag level so or lag length so once we click that we click on ok and then we can basically now see so these are the different criteria the names are given there and then we said that we just need to focus on the akaike and swatch and in this case we can actually see that the akaike and the swatch both um, suggest the lag of order two so and therefore meaning that when we are going to estimate our final var we should use the lag of order two now having done that um remember now that um we can only estimate the standard var or the unrestricted var if there is no co-integration um so meaning that we also have to test for co-integration i didn't mention it in the um slides but definitely we have to um test for it i mean when i was doing the theoretical slides in the previous lecture um uh, i didn't mention it but we also have to test for co-integration um but however um i before i test for that i also have to check um i've checked for stability and all the other stuff so i still have to check for um um the residual for the following you have to test for autocorrelation okay so we can test for autocorrelation and to see whether there is any problem with autocorrelation um we can basically look at the probability value here and it basically as we can see the pro the probability values here are actually greater than the level of significance and so for that reason we do not reject the null hypothesis of no serial correlation so meaning that we don't have a problem of serial correlation and so therefore our model is good to go and then again we can test for um we can leave the normality out um but you know you can check for it and you know the interpretation as i did it then we can check for heteroscedasticity so we said in order for us not to uh, in order for us to actually kill two birds with one stone let us just use the one that includes cross term so that we can check for both um heteroscedasticity that comes from specification or uh, or the pure one the pure one so um we click on white heteroscedasticity with cross terms and again we can basically see from the probability probability value that um this probability value is greater than the alpha level of significance, so implying that the uh, null hypothesis of homoscedastic uh, cannot be rejected, and so therefore we don't have a problem of heteroscedasticity. So now having done that, we can now do our final test, which is the test for cointegration. So if you click on view, you click on cointegration test, and don't change anything, just leave it on where it is. So then you just click on OK. So when you click on OK, this is basically what you get. Now you see, I said there are two tests. So, and you see, you have the trace test and the maximum eigen. So with the trace test, you then have these are your calculated value, these are your critical value. So you can copy this and paste it as it is. Otherwise, your supervisor might ask you to construct the table that I've shown you in the other slides. And so therefore, if you have to do that, then you have to uh, write this as the calculated values and these are the critical values. And now we can basically see even here below, we are already being told that trace test indicates no cointegration. We can also just look here. If you compare the calculated value with the critical value, you can see the calculated value is less than the critical value. So meaning um, we um cannot reject the null hypothesis of no cointegration it is true that there is no cointegration and we can also check the second one again 2.56 that's this calculated value is less than um, this critical value and so therefore there is no cointegration according to the trace statistics if we go to the maximum a again it is the same thing um such that this calculated value 10.45 is less than 14.2 and also 2.5 is less than 3.84 and so therefore again both test statistics did agree that there is no cointegration. But sometimes, as I said, they might actually differ, whereby um, one is saying there is, the other is saying there is nothing. In such a situation, if you look in the, um, uh, 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 if there is such a situation, then you have to follow the um, uh, trace statistic. Um, actually, I will talk more about this um, in greater details when I uh, go and discuss the vector error correction model. But for now, you should just know that if the calculated values, if at 
if the calculated values are greater than the critical values, then definitely there is no need for <clears throat> there is no cointegration um, and vice versa. Now we know that there is no coin no cointegration, so meaning that we can now just estimate our final var and so that we can then uh, derive our impulse response function and the uh, various decomposition. So we just click on view, then we go on. Sorry, I mean, from there, we just, sorry, not view, but we click on estimate. Now, this is our final var. So since there is no cointegration, we just re-estimate it as it is. And um, if, if there was cointegration, we, we were going to estimate a vector error correction. But uh, again here, now this is where you have to change the lag. So here, if since the lag is say that it's two, we don't have to change anything. We leave it as it is. But if it was three, we were, we were then going to change this number to three. But now it's two, so we leave it as two. All right, so we click on OK. So that is our VAR. Now from here, we can now estimate, I mean, we can now derive our impulse response as well as the various decomposition. So how do we do that? So from this output, we click on View, then we click on Impulse Response. Now remember, we have to use graphs. And remember, I told you that we need to use the generalized impulse response because we don't want to be biased in terms of um, the ordering of the variable. So now in order for you to do that, you go on impulse definition and you change on generalized. So once you do that, you go back on display and you hear what you want to do. You want to see how, here you want to see how CPI or how the variables respond to one another. So you can leave them as such, but here you can basically, um, uh, uh, leave um, you can leave them both of them or if you can change them if you want otherwise you can just you know both leave both of them there so here it shows you the period these are 10 quarters um, uh, so and then I'll just click on okay so once I click on okay this is the output and you remember I spoke about the interpretation now here we want to look as to how does interest rate respond to shocks in inflation Basically, you can see if inflation is in, is you can see here um, how it, it, it just remains on the positive side. And then later after five quarters, it basically moves to the negative side. So meaning that if maybe there's an increase in inflation, uh, interest rate um, decreases. But of course, that is in contradiction with what theory says, because it's supposed to be vice versa. Usually when inflation increases, then interest rate is supposed to be increased so that um, it suppresses the increase in prices. And then you can see here how inflation responds to an increase in uh, interest rate. Uh, but then again, it's in contradiction with the theory. So um, you have to find an explanation as to why is it the case. So, and then from there, we can go and actually then estimate or rather look for the various decomposition. You just go, you click on view, you go on various decomposition. Now here you have to choose the table. OK, you have to choose the table and you can just here indicate that you you don't have to change anything. You just click on OK. So then it gives you the table. It tells you the fluctuation. For example, the first one, it says various decomposition of PR, which is the interest rate. So it's basically telling you the fluctuations in um, interest rate that are caused by the, its own shocks and also that are caused by the shocks in inflation. You can basically see that most of the fluctuations in interest rate are caused by itself, um, even after 10 quarters. And then again, the second one gives you the forecast error decomposition, various decomposition for in, in, in inflation that are, and you can basically see that in this case, the most of the fluctuations in inflation are also caused by itself in the first, almost the first five quarters. But you can actually see that after 10 quarters, most of these were actually, you also have um, uh, fluctuations resulting from shocks in interest rate, as you can see, the value of 26. And I mean, they have given the example of how to interpret it in the previous slides, but you can also read the articles that I've actually provided you with. So that is really how you go about estimating the vector autoregressive model.